Hi everyone, uh, I'm Helena Zancani. Uh, again, I apologize if the video goes rocky every once in a while. I tend to talk with my hands. I swear I'm not actually Italian, but I do talk that way. Um, so you are doing a very basic beginner veil class. We're gonna talk a little bit about the history of veils, which is yes, uh, and then how you hem a veil, general sizing, general shaping, and how you actually fix it to your head without it flying off. So first thing, uh, if you have looked at the documentation, you can just follow along from there because it's the same thing. Uh, if you want to follow along and so as you go, please get your equipment out because we'll need that pretty soon. So veils have basically been used as long as we have had woven cloth. The instant we figured out how to make woven cloth, someone said, my head's warm, I'm gonna put cloth on it and that will fix the problem. Uh, veils were really commonly used, obviously, to cover your hair, uh, considered a part of modesty or sometimes religious significance, and they're just, they're continuous, which is great because it means no matter what your persona is, you've got a veil you could wear. Uh, most veils, not all, most veils were made of linen. Uh, they have also been made of silk, made of cotton. Uh, there has actually been wool ones. I would, I can't imagine wanting to do that unless I was very cold, but there's been fabric from sort of every natural fabric has been used. Uh, but we're going to be focusing on sort of mid to late uh, medieval times. So roughly 12, 1400s. And for that time period, the most common was linen, was silk sometimes, and the most common was white or not white. So I'm going to show you an example of a veil I've already made. This is Georgette, she's my, she's my assistant. Uh, and this veil that she's wearing is hand hemmed. It's a fairly small one, and this is actually a silk cotton blend. So basically, if you're looking at what shape and size you want the veil to be, a lot of it has to do with sort of how you want your hair to look, because the veil frequently takes the place of how your hair frames your face. Uh, the most common shapes for veils were square or rectangle, uh, circles and ovals. I tend to like doing circles and ovals. Uh, I find them a little more versatile in how I can wear them and what I can do with them. And also it means I don't have to hem around a corner and I don't like hemming around the corners. I'm gonna page down, excuse me for one moment. Okay, so in the Facebook group, you probably saw the sewing supplies, but just a reminder, you will need a piece of linen, cotton, or silk, like so. Uh, I put in about 40 inch uh, by 40 inch, but if you want a smaller veil, you can make it out of a smaller amount of fabric. That is not a problem at all. Uh, the weight of your fabric matters. We're going to be doing a rolled, uh, rolled hem stitch, and that is easier on lighter fabric. So there is something called handkerchief weight or veil weight linen, and that's pretty much perfect for what you're gonna do. Uh, you will also need some needles. Uh, you can use any size you want, absolutely any size. I tend to like the smallest needle I can get away with, which for me is this one. It's not gonna, there we go, sort of. So this is a, I think size 20 sharp. Uh, and I like it because I tend to knot my thread as opposed to not knotting it, not knotting, close enough. Uh, and the smaller my needle, the less I have to worry about the hole it's making in the fabric being too big and the knot just slipping through. You will need thread that's the same color as your fabric. You can use just sort of standard cotton or poly thread, no problem. Uh, if you want to get fancy, you can buy this kind of thread. I'm trying to make it so it looks at it. See, look. This is why I'm not a beauty vlogger. I can't do the hand thing. Uh, and this is uh, Gooderman and it's silk thread. Both work perfectly fine. I've had no problems with either one. You will need a pair of scissors for cutting your fabric and or uh, a pair of snips, which are teeny scissors for cutting your thread. You can cut your thread with your fabric scissors it's not going to be a problem. You can technically cut your fabric with these tiny scissors. It might take you the entire video to do it, but you can do it. All right, so for making our veil, I'm just going to describe how to make a round veil. Uh, square veil is pretty much just 
cut the fabric to the size you want, and then we're hemming it. Round veil is really, really simple. I am going to use a pre-made round veil. That's my pre-made veil. Uh, and this is the part where everyone who gets motion sickness should look away for a few seconds as I make the camera look down and you might get a little ill. So hold on for one second. All right, working space. So here's our fabric. If you are wanting to make a round or uh, an oval shaped veil, it's really simple. To figure out how big you want the veil, you're just going to take your fabric and just drape it over your head. So just like Georgette here uh, has her veil draped over her head, drape it down, you want the edge to at least hit your shoulder, and it can go longer than your shoulder. It can honestly go pretty much as long as you want, uh, depending on your time period, but at least hitting your shoulder. So roughly your veil needs to be from one shoulder over the head to the other shoulder, and the back can be as long as you want, which is why you can do a, a round or an oval. Once you have figured that size out, you take your square or rectangle of fabric, you fold it in half, and then you're going to fold it in half again. So on your fabric, there will be a corner here. That's the corner we don't want. It's useless to us, it's dead to us. So a couple different easy ways to do this. You can eyeball it. No one's going to notice if your circle isn't perfectly circular. Um, frequently, I have made veils that ended up sort of ovally when I meant to be meant to be a perfect circle, and I like them better because I found a particular spot on the veil that just made it drape wonderfully. So, if you want to eyeball it, you can get a piece of chalk, you can get a pencil, uh, you can get you know those friction pens that they sell that that you can mark with the pen and then erase uh, with the back, and it just friction erases. Those also erase with heat, so those work really great as fabric pens. Uh, and you can just mark the line that you want and cut on that line. If you're not comfortable with that, I personally am not comfortable with that, you can use any round object you have to figure it out. You can also grab a piece of thread or ribbon or something and hold it at the corner and then just mark along the edge as you go. And that will give you a nice round shape. So once you've done that, you're just going to cut this circle in and you will unfold and you'll have your completely unhemmed veil. And here is my completely unhemmed veil. And I'm going to move this much closer because you're gonna need to be able to see the stitching. So apologies again for those who get motion sick. Hopefully this isn't too bad. Yeah, it's not too bad. Come on, focus in. It doesn't want to. It's like this is as focused as I get. Uh, and this is also a silk linen blend that I happen to already have because I make too many veils. So now that you have your circle, you need to know how to hem it. The nice thing about this stitch, this stitch is fast. Uh, it will stitch up incredibly quickly. So go ahead and pick out your needle. Uh, if you have not sewn before uh, and you're not sure how long to make your thread, generally an arm's length is a good length to go with. I hate making knots, so I make mine too long because everyone has a flaw and that's one of mine. We are not using double width thread, so we're not actually going to be using the thread twice uh, twice over. You don't knot both ends together. We're just going to put a knot in one end. All right, so there's my thread. Goodness, this is really not wanting to focus. How do I get to focus? Focus. Focus. It really ain't focusing. I can see it okay. 
It okay. Seems, yeah, it's, it doesn't seem too bad. I can see the thread and I can see the, yeah, I mean, I think it's okay. All right. Well, keep an eye on the con comments and if people are having trouble seeing the, uh, the stitches, I'll see what I can do to, to okay. be the solution. <laughs> All right, put a knot in the end of your thread. I knot three times because I'm paranoid. But once or twice should be fine. Snip the edge off, just blow your knot. And we are ready to go. Okay, if you're making a circular bale, you can pick to start anywhere, it doesn't matter. So what you're going to do is you're going to take I'm getting lots of comments. Something dark under the fabric. That's about as dark as it hmm. Do I have anything dark? I apologize, I have nothing darker. Maybe my skirt. Will that do will that do anything? Let's see. Uh it still doesn't like the veil. I don't know. Um, so if you would like me to stitch with a contrasting color thread, I can do that. How, what do the comments say? Yeah, okay. that's probably a good idea. That'll work. Cool. Give me one moment and I'm going to get an obnoxiously bright thread. Okay. <laughs> Can you hear me while you're yeah. looking? Um, so somebody asked, and I was curious too, where did you get that fabric from? Uh, I got it, I live in Portland, so I got it from a place called Fabric Depot because uh, I like to shop in person. Uh, but you can go online and just search handkerchief weight linen. Uh, and that will take you to 8 billion linen stores that will sell linen of this, roughly this consistency. Uh, and a lot of them will have linen, uh, linen silk blends or cotton silk blends. All right, we are using a red thread now. Gosh, this just does not want to Look at that, see, you can't read anything. You're a bad camera. I just think you should know that. I'm gonna try lifting it slightly higher to see if maybe it's just a too close issue. You would think that a camera that's intended at least partially for selfies wouldn't have this issue, but you would be wrong. All right, cut me some thread. Sorry, please let me know if I just suddenly move out of frame because I shouldn't do that. That's me being a bad instructor. You know, just to make this slightly easier to see, I will go ahead and double my thread up to make it just a little bit wider so you guys can see a little easier. There we go. All right. Grab whichever edge of your fabric you want to play with first. The thing about the stitch, and anytime you are stitching with a veil, you want to make this hem as small as possible. It is okay if it's bigger on your first couple tries because you're learning, it's cool. But basically what you're going to do is you're going to fold this down a very small amount and I can barely see it. Can you see it? You can move out of the way. So I did this about, I've got a, I've got a measuring stick. I'm going to measure it. About half a centimeter to a centimeter. So pretty darn small. You're going to take your needle and just insert through that fold from the inside to the outside. That's going to bury your knot on the inside so you won't see it. And here comes the magic part of the stitch. This does take a little getting used to, but you'll get really good at it. So the first thing you're going to do is pick up a couple threads, just the small stitch you can, right at the edge of that fold. 
page. Can we get it to see? Oh, you really can't. If you've got the handout, move down to page three at the top and you will see this stitch. So you just take a little bit from the base fabric just in front of the raw edge and then a little bit from directly above it at the fold. You do not have to pull this tight. You're just gonna pull it till it serve a loose loop. And you'll see that in the handout. Then we're going to do another stitch exactly the same. So you usually wanna do, depending on how nicely your fabric is playing, between three and five stitches like this. So I've got my three stitches started. And then once I feel comfortable with it, I'm just going to tug that fabric or tug that thread. And what that does is that rolls the entire hem up so that only these stitches show. God, this is just awful. No, a little bit. You can sort of see it. If I go lower. I'm sorry, guys. I should have gotten a better camera for you guys. We'll do better next time. And you just go through the entire veil that way. So take a stitch. Don't knot your thread the way I did. And then just keep going through. So the only weird piece of advice I have for you, and I apologize for this one because it is a bit weird to explain over a camera. When you're pulling these tight, when you've got a few stitches on and you want to tug them down, you want them to be snug, but not super tight. And I know that feels like a useless piece of advice, but the reason for that is that if you make these, if you pull this as tight as you possibly can, and you can do it because the thread's pretty strong, you will end up with a edge on your veil that is very stiff because it doesn't have a lot of movement. And that can work. It can give you a very pretty ripple to the edge of your veil, but it can also make it so that your veil sort of sticks up oddly. So have you ever seen that happen? Most likely the edge was just, the stitches were pulled too tightly. So um, a quick question, I think this is yes. probably a good point to ask it. So the, the kind of ripples in the front of the veil that you, um, you shared that was on the mannequin, mm -hmm. um, is, is that, does that kind of, is that created because of this stitch? That is not entirely created because of the stitch. Uh, this stitch, because it's a rolled hem, it does tend to make the hem just slightly stiffer than the fabric itself. It can be created from a couple things. One can be pulling your, your stitches really tight. That will make this entire edge a little bit stiffer. Uh, part of it is also the fabric you're using. So this fabric that I'm playing with right now, and this is a great thing to do if you're playing with fabric and you can't decide if you want to use it. Stick your hand on the inside and just see how it drapes off of your hand. Because what you'll see is how densely or loosely the weave is. For veils, you don't want a very dense weave because a denser weave means a stiffer fabric. So this one probably on the head is not going to make a ton of ripples. Uh, and the ripples that it does make are going to be smaller. This fabric, which is a little harder to see. Um, this fabric has thicker, is it weft or weave on this one? I think it's weft. And I'm sorry, you just not gonna be able to see this from the camera. Uh, but the weft on this one is actually a thicker thread. And that means that even though it's not super densely woven, the entire thing, like, let me hold it up. So I've got this stuck up on my hand. And see how it's just running off my hand in a fairly stiff manner? The entire thing is going to do that, which means that the veil edge is going to have a lot more rippling to it. I can actually kind of see it on the on the video. I can see you can see the lines the one direction a lot more than you can see the other one. Um, so, can you go through how to do the stitch again? Yes. All right. So you're going to have a single fold 
in your edge. You're going to take your needle, you're going to go to the base fabric just in front of the raw edge, and then you're going to take a tiny stitch, and then straight up from that, goodness, the lighting, um, you're going to take a stitch right at the fold. And then pull that through, it does not have to be tight. You can make every stitch tight if you want to, but it's much faster if you don't. And just stitch it through loosely. And then you take a few more stitches done the exact same way. So just really light, loose stitches. Once you've got somewhere between three and five like this, just pull them down and they tighten themselves up. So you've just got that tiny row of stitches along the edge. And then you go through the entire thing. I did a veil slightly smaller than this one. I think this is actually 37 inch. Uh, I did about a 30 inch one in hand sewing at about four, four hours. I just sort of sat down and watched some documentaries because I'm that kind of geek. And it's really quick. The nice thing is once you get used to this stitch, you don't have to pay attention to it as you go, especially if you're not doing a square veil and you're just going in a circle. So it's a great stitch to do when you want something to do with your hands, but you don't necessarily want to be paying attention to it. All right, I have gotten um, to how, the... uh, how far apart do you, uh, do you like to space the stitches? And does it depend on how heavy the cloth is? Um, it doesn't depend on how, how heavy the cloth is very much. Uh, it depends partially on how tightly woven the cloth is, but since most veils are going to be fairly loosely woven, you do want the stitches very close together. And I'm just going to measure mine to see where they're at. I've got my stitches very Victorian length, about every two millimeters. So they're not quite right on top of each other, but they're close. I don't know if I can get this that close. You can barely see the, the red. So every, every terribly rendered red dot is a stitch. I also told people we can take some pictures after. Yes, um, I'll be and, happy to uh, And then um, I, I'll post them in the, in the blog post with the video. So that so way there's... I am also at one of the problems you can come up to in round veils. And that's where I've stitched a bit of it. And now, let's see, do I have something contrasting I can use? Maybe that'll work. So the edge, the raw edge of my veil is now going like this. It's actually trying to run off to the raw edge completely. So I lose my fold. And that's very common because you're basically doing a straight edge onto a round surface. If that happens just right after it would roll off, like right here, I'm just going to refold it again. So what will happen is you will have this teeny, teeny little pin tuck right there where it's got sort of this little bumped up ripple, like you've got a teeny mountain in there. And you just ignore that bit. Just pretend that that's not there. It will not affect your sewing in any way, but that will help your veil to maintain that round shape if you're not knotting your thread like I am. I'm having thread issues today. So I'm going to try and get right up to that edge. Okay. So on mine, I've taken this, I folded it about that half millimeter again, and I've got a tiny ripple right here. I'm literally going to ignore it. I'm just going to take my normal stitches because it won't affect the normal stitches at all. And that will end up getting rolled right into the inside of this rolled hem. No one will ever see it. You won't even be able to find it yourself. And you can just say, no, all of my veils are perfect. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, suggestions for not pulling your needle off the thread as you sew. <laughs> Leave your tail ridiculously long. Um, one of the things I do is you'll notice that when I'm holding it, I'm not holding with two fingers. These are the fingers I'm using for most of my sewing. But anytime I'm pulling, this middle finger pinches down on the eye of the needle. And so it's actually pinching the thread. 
that being said, I've still lost my thread several times. It's just hazard of sewing. Uh, so that might help. That might be a little trick that helps you. So when I'm pulling, I'm just doing this and the thread can't go anywhere because I've got it pinched. You do not need to wax your thread if you don't want to. You can if you want to. It won't hurt it, but it's not required for this. You are using really thin thread on a fairly loosely woven fabric. It's not going to worry you. So I'm going to do one thing though. I'm going to go ahead and knot this off. Let's pretend that I sewed a ridiculously long seam and we're done with my thread. So I'm just going to knot this off. When I do that, this is my preference. So this isn't something you're required to do. Oh yes, you can absolutely machine wash. No worries. I throw my veils in the machine all the time because all of my veils like to get dunked in my coffee. It's just the thing. What's the name of the stitch? Do you know? Uh, this is usually called a rolled hem stitch. I've also heard it called a rolled handkerchief stitch and a rolled veil stitch, but usually rolled hem is the easiest. So when I'm gonna knot this off, you can just put a couple knots in it. Uh, again, with the I'm paranoid with my sewing, so what I tend to do is just do a couple of straight back stitches right where that, that uh, last stitch is. And what that does is if you do two or three of them right on top of each other, which is what I'm doing here, they tend to make a really tight grip in the fabric right there. So even if my knot comes undone, it's probably not going to lose this, this hem at all. So I'll go ahead and knot this off really quick. Do you do the back stitches before or after the knot? I do three back stitches and then the knot. And then if you want to be extra paranoid, because why not when you're sewing, you can take your needle and run it right into this circle of your uh, rolled hem which I don't know if I can do it on camera, I'll try. So that you bury, and you don't have to do it a long ways. You just want to bury maybe a half inch or so of the tail of your thread inside that rolled hem. Because the longer you have a tail before you cut it, the less likely your knot is to unravel. So I just ran it through about this long, and then I'm going to pinch that fabric and gather it a little bit so that when I cut it, that just hides right back into the fabric and that tail is gone. So somebody asked, um, this might be a more advanced question, but I have seen veils with trim, would this, or would that affect the roll, uh, the rolled hem? In other words, would you do the rolled hem in the same way? I would do the rolled hem in the same way. So. What I would do if I was doing a trimmed veil is I would put the hem in and then add the trim afterwards. Uh, same thing if I'm doing a beaded veil, which for all of those who like blingy veils, uh, there is absolutely, absolutely visual documentation of what looks like jet beads uh, and also pearls. Uh, they're stitched at different intervals along the hem of your veil. So you can have a really blingy veil if you want. So one of the other issues you do tend to run into on the stitch is once you've used your first thread up and you've got it knotted and you have to start a new thread, you're going to sit there and think, wait, I need to get this inside that, that roll and the roll's already made. So what you're going to do on the section that you've already done, it's basically for all intents and purposes rolled twice. On the section you have not done yet, it's still only rolled once. So as close to that final stitch as you can, you're going to do the same thing you did the first time. So you're just going to put your needle from the inside to the outside right through to that fold and pull through to bury the knot. And then you're going to do it just like you're starting the veil for the first time. Small stitch into the main fabric, small stitch at the, the roll, and make your stitch. And that will still have 
the same perfect roll that you had before. So let's see, what else have I not addressed? Uh, what other questions do people have about the stitch or how to make it work or problems that you're having? Um, so somebody says, some of my hem is beautifully rolled. Some of it is just folded over. What am I doing wrong? You're not necessarily doing something wrong, but most likely the width of your fold over has changed as you go. So the wider this is, and actually, you know what? Give me one second. I'm going to use my skirt to see if it makes it a little easier. So yeah, it, it, apparently it's the veil that it hates. Okay, so if you've got this fold over real, real small, like just teeny, then you're more likely to get a roll. The wider that fold is, so if you make it a little bit wider, the more likely your fabric is to just fold over itself instead of rolling itself. Um, it could, if it's happening consistently through your entire fabric, then that might just be that your fabric is fairly heavy. The heavier your fabric is, the more likely it is to fold. If it's a small fold, it doesn't matter. It'll still be perfectly fine. Okay, so turning a corner. Oh, so yeah, what about, oh, well, there's a question before oh, that. Oh. So um, I'm, I'm getting lots of raw edge sticking out from the, uh, I'm getting lots of raw edge sticking out from the roll. Would you just trim that? Yeah, if it's just loose, uh, loose threads, uh, especially with linen, you tend to get, you'll get sections that are quite pretty and straight like this, and you'll get sections that have done this and gone all, all weird and hairy. Uh, once I get to this type of section, I will just trim it off. So I'll just go through and give my veil a little haircut as I go. Uh, especially if you've ended up being in a section that's basically straight across the uh, the weft of your fabric, you're going to see that happen all the time. Very, very normal. Don't worry. You were doing nothing wrong. <laughs> Don't worry. That just means that your thread was misbehaving. It wasn't your fault. It was the thread. Always blame the tools. So I'm going to see... This was one of the earlier veils oh, I made. I think I asked a question and I was muted, sorry. Um, <laughs> so, uh -huh. what, what about turning a corner on square veils? Yes, turning a corner. Okay, so turning a corner isn't actually as hard as it sounds like it would be. The weirdest thing that you might have to do is a slight whip stitch right at the fold. So I'm gonna try and picture it on this one as I can. Can I make this sort of squarish? Sort of. God, I really can't on this. Okay, I'll just try and try and describe it. So you're going to use your rolled hem all the way across. Go ahead and just run it straight off the edge. So you've got one edge completely rolled hemmed, one edge completely raw. Fold over the raw part and you'll find that your thread is now part of that fold over. It's right near that raw edge. And what I would suggest doing is right there, just go in like you normally would. So if you've got, God, if this is your rolled hem and this is your raw hem, you're just going to fold it over just like you would when you're starting a new veil. And then you're going to go ahead and go from right at the edge of the rolled hem, take a, take a um, stitch on the base fabric over the raw section, stitch at the fold, and then pull. And the whole thing will fold again and it will roll itself. You may have a couple of uh, raw edges sort of sticking out at that corner. If that happens, trim them off a little bit and then just whip stitch over. So just, I always call it the Cinderella stitch because it's the one they did in the movie. So you just go under over, make a big circle. So a big looping stitch. And you just stitch right along the, the edge of those two folds and that will fix that. Um, so let's see if you're going if you're going to an Italian veil that just hangs off the back of the head what shape would you use? For an Italian veil? Hmm. I would say probably a long rectangle would be the easiest uh, just to get the drape that you want. 
Uh, I actually have worn an Italian veil. I had a gold organza one that was very pretty. It's gone now. It's it's disappeared. My my clothing gremlin ate it someday. Uh, and I actually made a really long oval, just super elongated oval. Uh, but you basically just want something that's very long. So you can make it a long oval or you can make it a long rectangle. I think rectangles will be easier to affix to your hair. Also, wig clips on those things. If you know that that veil is only ever going to be used with that Italian style where you're going to clip it sort of to the base of your hair, stick a couple of wig clips in and do that. It's so much easier. Uh, let's see. So somebody was trimming an uneven part of the circle and snipped her thread. Any idea how far back she should go to start the next thread to keep it from coming undone? I would say probably about half an inch should give you all of the the straight uh, uh, pull that you need on that. Okay. And then uh, on the handout, it looks like your stitches are in a W-shaped line. Yeah. Is it cool to do more of an N-shaped line? Yeah, absolutely. No problem there. You can, on the stitch from the base fabric to the fold, you can do that straight up and down, or you can do that diagonaled. And it won't matter either way, whichever one is more comfortable. If we got all That's all the questions we have right now. Okay, cool. So I'm gonna turn this back to face me. Hey, look, we're here again, hi. Let me try and move it back slightly. Okay, while you guys stitch and have some fun with that, I'm gonna talk about how you wear a veil. Where's my, where's my extra veil? Oh, there you are. Come here, you. Somebody just asked what period Italian veil is worn at the back of the head. Mm, how is that, it worn at the back of the head? That was, so Italy is the weirdest culture because in basically every other uh, European culture, veils were used to cover your hair. And in Italy, and I'm just going to assume this is because it was hot and muggy there all year round, they did not cover their hair much. Uh, there was a big culture of keeping your head uncovered and married women would just have very elaborate hairstyles to indicate their rank. So wearing your hair, uh, wearing your veil so that it really doesn't cover much of your head was pretty common through the late medieval time period. So I would say 15, 1500s, 1600s, um, possibly, possibly even the late 1400s, because the portraitures from that time period uh, frequently had uncovered hair. Uh, a great resource for portraits by time period for Italy, unfortunately this is specific to Venice, uh, is, oh goodness, what's it called? I'm trying to remember now. Give me one second, I'm gonna find this for you. Oh, I remembered, Realm of Venus. Uh, so it's a website online, gorgeous information about dresses, uh, lots of portraits. I believe it's in the section called the wardrobe. They also have a library with a lot of documentation. So if you like doing late period Italian, it's an excellent resource. Somebody asked if there's a rule of thumb for how close together the stitches should be. You want them really close. Um, stitch width is weird because a lot of what we know of uh, and a lot of what we think of in popular culture as medieval is seen through a Victorian lens. Uh, the Victorians, the Victorians did history based on a true story. Uh, and they were very particular about their stitches. Victorian stitches all had to be the same length, exactly the same width, exactly the same distance apart, exactly. It is not true if you look at extant garments. Uh, they tended to vary. But with this kind of fabric, I would say you really want them just ridiculously close. I would go with probably every two to three millimeters. Uh, if you, unless the, unless you're stitching through the same hole each time, uh, you, you're fine. <laughs> you, but you can really put them as close as you can possibly manage and not be too worried. You're welcome, Joanne. Okay, any other questions? Nope, nothing right now. Okay, so wearing a veil. This is farther down the handout. You can go back and look at that later. Uh, so you basically 
for most hairstyles, you need to do two things. You need your hair up and off your neck, uh, and you need to have something to attach your veil to because you don't want to pin it to your scalp, that hurts. So I have my hair in a little bun. Um, I will actually take it down really quick so you can see its length. I don't have super long hair. You can in fact do this with hair even shorter than mine. But there you go, my hair is just past my shoulder. I don't have very long hair. So what I do is put it into a ponytail. I've got very skinny hair, so I use a tiny ponytail holder. Oh, goodness, but maybe without that. There. You can make the bun or however else you're going to put your hair low, you can make it high, whichever you're more comfortable with. Uh, generally, if you don't want it to be seen below the veil, if you don't want to bump anywhere, you want it to be fairly low. So I've got mine quite low. Uh, however you like to do buns is perfectly fine, but I live and die by these things. Uh, these are called hairpins. They are not bobby pins, and these are what we were used in medieval times all the way up through like the 1940s. And then they just stopped really being used very frequently. Uh, these ones were called extra, I think they were called like extra strong Amish hairpins. I got them on Amazon. They are very, very cheap. They come in a pack of, uh, I think there was 10 or 20 in the pack. Uh, and these are brilliant. These will hold my hair and my hair is very fine, does not have a lot of curl and is very slick. So. It basically comes out of anything I do to it. But those will hold my hair all day. So I'm just gonna pull my hair into a very ugly tight bun. And then I just take this and sink it straight through. You can do as many of these pins as you want. If I were using bobby pins, there would probably be about 10 in my head right now. This bun will stay all day with two of these. So these are brilliant. I love these things. So put your hair up in a bun. Uh, you can put it up in a ponytail if you're going to use a St. Bridget's cap because it will still hide the whole thing. And then you have two basic options. So one is the St. Bridget's cap or St. Brigitte cap. Uh, I have one <laughs> somewhere. I'm having my closet redone, so I can't find any of my stuff. I'm so sorry. Uh, but they're very comfortable uh, and they're great for that, you know, final day of the event. Your hair is unwashed. It's not looking its best. You just put that cap on. No one can see it. But the other thing you can use is a fillet, which is literally just a headband. Uh, I didn't have one before, so I whipped this up right before class. And I think it took me about 10 minutes. It's real quick. If you want to make one, there is no... Oh, oh cool. Uh, yes, Disa, please share that if you can. That'd be fantastic. Uh, if you want to make a fillet, it is really simple. You can make it wider. I've made mine about an inch to an inch and a half. I think I made it an inch and a half. No, I made it two inches. Um, but you can make it basically whichever width you like. Take a piece of linen or cotton, something that's going to be comfortable and breathable against your skin. Measure it on your head from the back across at least where your hairline is. You can have it lower if you want, but at least here, and you want a bit longer. So however length, length that is, just cut a piece of cloth that long, and then cut it three inches wide. Then all you have to do is put the edges together, stitch that down in whichever stitch you want. You can use your sewing machine, uh, you can do a straight stitch, you can do a back stitch, whatever stitch you like that connects two pieces of fabric, you can use on that. And then you have to turn it inside out and it's completely okay to swear when you're doing that, because I do. So for a fillet, all you're going to do is take your fillet. You want to put it, again, this is dependent on what you want to do, uh, but at the very least, cover your hairline. So it needs to be at least this low. Uh, because if you have it any farther back on your head like this, 
the whole thing will slip down. It will just start slowly moving itself across your head. You can have it lower, but the point of the fillet is not to necessarily have it be shown uh, unless you decide to make a very pretty one. Then you're just going to, I don't know if you can see, hold the edges together. I made mine just slightly too long. And as with everything else in, in medieval times, everything's held together with pins. So I'm just going to pin this. Try not to pin your own skin to it because that's fairly uncomfortable. And there we go. That is going to stay on my head. I look like I'm getting ready to have a montage of fighting. Ta -da. Uh, so this is my base. No one in theory will be seeing this once I've got my uh, veil on. This is my veil. It is roughly a circle. You can see it's, I don't know if you can see, but you should be able to see it's old because it's got all sorts of stains on it. I'm hoping these are coffee, but I sew a lot of my veils, so these also could be blood. So you have a couple different options on how to wear this. You can do it with the edge across your head. And I'll show you that one first because that's the one that everyone likes the most usually in my experience. So basically, this is about what you like. So there's no hard and fast rule about how low your veil has to be, how high it has to be. You basically just want to cover up your fillet. Uh, clearly my fillet is visible because this is a very light veil that I normally wear with a St. Bridget's cap. But I like, I like this. This is like a veil bang. So I have two options. I can just pin it. What I tend to do though, is right about temple. So this is my temple. I will take a little bit of my veil and I will create a little tuck. And my reasons for that is it pulls a bit more of my veil to the front and I like having the veil sort of cutting off the edges of my face. But also it gives me two layers of veil to pin through, which I feel just makes it a little more secure. And again, you're just gonna pin through the veil and the fillet, try not to pin your skin. There we go. And it's vertical, right? Perpendicular to the fillet. It's technically you can do it another anyway, but I would say don't do it straight up and down. Um, you can do it right along the fillet. You can do it like mine where it's just slightly off. Just don't do it right up and down because at some point you will turn your head or hug someone and you will stab them or you. Ask me how I know. <laughs> and then I'm going to do the same thing on the other side. You can use very pretty veil pins for this uh, and they will look lovely. Uh, you can use plain pins. I wouldn't suggest ones with the bright yellow heads because they will be very obvious. Uh, these ones are, I bought at Joann's and these are just pins with glass heads on them. I think I got them in the quilting section. And this is completely period. That type of pin would normally have happened. Uh, I also really like the ones with the faux pearl on it. Or you can use the one that's just a plain flat head. And those ones disappear quite a bit. So that is sort of your basic one. If you want to be fancy schmancy, you can make a second pretty fillet and wear it above this. And that one won't necessarily hold your veil on as much, uh, but it will give you a really nice sort of headband to look pretty and medievally. So this is a really common way of, of wearing your veil. Uh, people really like having the little, the little ruffle, the little head, head, head bangs. The other way you can do this, that's also really common. And this is the nice thing about round veils, because if you want the look of a square veil, where you have a very straight, flat edge, you can do that. You're going to take your round veil and you're just going to fold it under. You can fold it completely in half. Uh, you can fold it, let me show you this way. You can do a very small amount of fold. I can't see, so I'm just going to hope you see this. Or you can fold it completely in half. So I'll show you what it looks like completely in half, because that would have been closer to common in the mid-1400s, especially in England. And this gives you a uh, uh, much more straight 
edge to the front. Uh, it can also make it much easier to fold uh, and to make it look pretty around your head. So you don't have to worry about what the edge of the veil is going to do. I'm just going to, so I've got them centered, center on my nose. And then I basically sort of run this line to where I want it. So I sort of want this to sit here. And then I see where it wants to fold. And it wants to fold right about there. So I'll just let it fold there. And again, pin to the fillet, not to your scalp. Takes all the fun out of it when you bleed on your project. And so I've got this side basically done. This side, I'm going to again put that fold where I want it. And then you see where it wants to fold. It wants to fold. I don't like that. I'm going to make it fold where I want to. About there. And that'll work. Ooh, tried to get my scalp. This one. This one was too far forward. Hey, pin the fillet, not the scalp. There we go. So this gives you um, just a straighter edge to it, a straighter look. And you can move back that way. So this is also a really common way to wear a circular veil. Uh, it gives you a little bit more heat protection because you've got a double double layer of the white fabric between your skin and the sun. Uh, also, this particular way works better under hats. Uh, like if you're doing a wide brimmed hat of any kind, if you have the ruffled edge of your veil and then you put a hat on it, it tends to smush it down a little bit and frequently makes it look a bit odd. So you might have to fuss with it a little more if you do that. Do you want me to show, you, show that uh, burgundy cap? Yes, works. please do. Okay. Whew. Take my veil off. One moment. I'm going to actually cancel your spotlight video and yeah. I'm going to turn on my video real quick here. There we go. Hi, guys. Okay, so I'm going to spotlight my video for just a second here. And um, okay, so I'm going to actually have to take off my headset in order to do this. So I also recently lost my Brigitte cap and couldn't find it. So I had to make a new one. I was telling her about it before this. It's huge. It's like the new one that I made is ridiculously huge. I do have a lot of hair, so it does still work for me. And I left um, a lot of it open. But basically, it's, it's, you know, a long kind of straight edge. And then kind of at the end, it's pleated in. Okay, on the back so that it kind of has kind of a bag look. And it's got two really long pieces here. So I'll show you how to throw it on real quick just so that so we can we can show that too. And then you would attach it in the same way as yep. on that. So I'm taking off my headset. I'm gonna talk louder and hopefully you'll be able to hear me. <laughs> so Okay. Can you hear me well enough? Yes. Uh, very quietly, but yes. I have a really low fuzz here with all of my hair. There's a lot of it. So I'm going to put this on like so. And then a lot of times these are looped, but I like to leave it loose so that I can wrap it around and keep it tight. So this, I'm just going to grab those on the back. I'm going to bring them around, cross them in the front, bring them to the back, and then just tie them like that. Again, I just made this, so these are way longer than they need to be, so I've ended up with this big long bit here. But then you can kind of adjust it wherever you want it to be. And from there, you just pin it in the same ways. So that's what the Brigitte cap does. So I'm going to flip it back to Helena. <laughs> 
So speaking of period sources and period pieces, I have not yet, but I haven't looked really hard yet, but I have not yet seen any indication of a under fillet, the one you wear under your veil, uh, being embroidered uh, along the edge or a St. Bridget's cap being embroidered along the edge. However, there are some amazing ones I've seen in the SCA where they've done a really subtle silver or gold embroidery uh, or even white embroidery on white fabric uh, along the edge of their St. Bridget's cap and then they've specifically put their veil so that the edge of the cap will show so that it's not completely covered. And that can look amazing. Uh, my favorite uh, sort of uh, Laurel in Hiding uh, wore that. She had a St. Bridget's cap with a silver laurel wreath embroidered into it and then the veil that she wore over that. So unless you were looking real hard, you wouldn't necessarily see it, but it was absolutely gorgeous. I have a plan to make one with gold bees on it because I think that would be pretty. Uh, what was I going to say? There was something about 12th century. What was it? Oh, uh, is anyone here doing a sort of 12th, 12th century, 13th century persona? Because that's a really common one with veils. Oh, thank you. White work embroidery on the original. Perfect. Now I feel like I've got... Perfect. Okay, so you are probably used to the concept of the veil and wimple. The wimple is literally just another veil, usually a square one. And you do the same thing. So I'm going to put my headband back on for a second. I'm going to answer a question really quickly here, okay. uh, just because it was about the cap. So the cap, uh, somebody asked if, if the cap is always worn over the ears. No, that's just me because I have glasses and it just, it makes it easier to, uh, you know, not have the glasses kind of flipping around. So you can wear them, you know, to hide your ears or not. Like she has her fillet that way. So, so imagine that I've got a, a veil on. Uh, so if I want to do a wimple, which is the veil that goes under the chin, made very popular by Eleanor of Aquitaine, uh, you're going to take a Round veil, that, round veil that you've folded in half, or you can use a square veil. I would still suggest folding it. Center right under the chin. You're going to bring it up and you'll literally just pin it right here. And you do fillet, wimple, and then veil over top. And it looks amazing. Uh, as Eleanor of Aquitaine figured out, it hides any double chins that you might be not wanting to show off uh, or any other body flaws that you're not super comfortable with yourself. Uh, but the other thing is, the other really common thing is with that hairstyle, you'll frequently see the two temple braids. And if you don't have waist length gorgeous hair, you probably sat there and went, those are great, I can't do that. I'm here to tell you, you can. So here's how you do that. There are two options. If your hair is super short, I would say if your hair is less than shoulder length, you probably won't be able to do this particular sheet method. Uh, however, you can buy hair at um, Joann's, or not Joann's, I'm sorry, Sally's Beauty Supply in the same color as yours. And then you can literally make two braids and you can just take the braids, pin them onto your fillet, put the veil and wimple on, no one will know the difference. I've done it multiple times, no one ever knew. But if your hair is roughly shoulder length, you can take it, give yourself roughly a center part. I apologize about how messy this is gonna look on me because I didn't bring any stuff to it. And then you take basically half of your hair and you're gonna do this. You're just gonna take the whole thing, comb it forward, comb it forward, keep going. until you get it right to the front. Like you were trying to do a pigtail, but you got really excited and went way too far forward. So you're gonna do that. And then cut into three, slightly more effectively than I am. There yeah, that'll work. And 
Root it up right there. Didn't bring my board quite enough. Hold on. More forward. This always feels so weird when you're doing it, by the way. Also, use a, use a comb when you do yours. Don't do this whole finger thing that I'm doing that's just gonna make it look very messy. So we've got forward. It's okay if you lose some in the back, that will be hidden by your veil. I use all of my hair because I have very little hair and I need all of it to make any kind of braid look normal. All right, I'm going to make two braids. My braids are gonna be fairly short because part of the hair I'm using is from the back. And so it's gotten all twiggy. So I've made a very short braid. But what I'm gonna do then is I'm gonna take the braid, I'm gonna grab a standard hair, hair clip I'm just going to clip it so it sits like that. Now the great part is, once you've done that, if you take your wimple and put it on, and then you have a veil over it, look! I've got a perfect temple braid! And no one needs to know my hair is way shorter than it should be to do this look. So, it's my favorite tip or trick for faking your medieval hair because I've tried growing my hair out long. It does not work very well. So we've got a couple of questions here. Yes, go ahead. You know, when the, um, when the cap came in? Hmm. I don't know the start of the St. Bridges cap actually, because uh, I tend to do late periods. So I tend not to have to look at when it first started. Uh, if, you, if you do a quick Google search online, I bet it'll show it. I can do it really quickly while you look for other questions. Oh, I've got more questions. Cool, where are the other questions? Um, do you know anything about Anglo-Saxon veils? Anglo-Saxon veils tended to be, so I know a little bit, um, and the problem, now are you talking Anglo-Saxon, how far back are you wanting for Anglo-Saxon? Because you can go back to like Norse-ish Anglo-Saxon or quite a bit forward. So like what time period? 13th century? Oh, that's for the bridges cap. It looks like any time for Anglo-Saxon, 600s okay. for some. So Anglo-Saxon, other than Italy, because Italy was its own very weird seafaring beast, uh, almost all of the rest of Europe, until you get into the age of um, a lot of sea travel happening, they tended to homogenize their veils quite a bit. And I think part of that is just because they were living in fairly similar climates uh, and what travel there was, was travel in between them. Uh, and part of that I think is just because there are just so many ways you can wear a piece of cloth on your head. You've got limits. Uh, so if you're looking at any time period you want to, until you get to about mid 1400s, that's when the countries really start to create their own set styles that are very specific to them. Uh, but before that, you want to pay more attention to the time period than to the culture. The culture will tend to tell you what fabric is made of, how heavy it is, and what colors it is, because it's going to be based on what's available in their area. But for how it's worn, that tends to be much more homogenized. So if you're looking at uh, 12th and 13th century, you're looking at a veil and a wimple. Uh, if you're looking at earlier than that, you're looking at usually a veil with a fillet, uh, sometimes under or over, sometimes you have a flower crown, which looks very cute. I don't look good in it, but other people look amazing. Uh, and the farther back you go, the more simple and smaller the veils tended to be. Uh, if you get all the way back to early Norse, what what we have that sort of shows us uh, when they wore veils, they tended to be almost kerchief style, much smaller, much heavier fabric, and it was worn sort of around the back of the head and somehow tied or pinned back. Uh, it seemed to be much more utilitarian focused. Uh, when they wanted to do very pretty stuff, they tended to do very elaborate braiding. 
Uh, let's see, what about uh, any info on Middle Eastern or Eastern European veils? So I don't have a whole ton of information, unfortunately, on that yet. Uh, I've got a couple friends who have done Middle Eastern and it, I don't have a whole lot of information, unfortunately. I know that most of the cultures tended to use what I would consider just like excessively huge veils, just incredibly large fabric, uh, because they would sort of be done as a veil and shawl combo, uh, or extremely long and they'd be done in uh, sort of a veiled turban. But other than that, I don't have a ton of information, unfortunately, on Midi uh, uh, Middle Eastern. Uh, let's see, what happens to the loose edges of the wimple on the top of the head above where it's pinned to the fillet? So those tend to just flutter down underneath the veil. So as an example, let's go put that under my chin. We will pretend that I've got it pinned. And then they, you can either let them hang down and they'll be hidden behind your veil. Or if you want to go a little bit more, a little bit more secure, you can fold them over each other. Let me get that straightened and you can pin them at the top as well. So whichever you're more comfortable with, uh, but they work perfectly fine just fluttering down at the edge. And that does tend to give you a little more give along the edge that's at your neckline. So I would say from period documentation, period sources, probably they didn't pin it at the top. They only pinned it towards the back of the fillet and let the rest hang down because your body has to still be able to move in this and you don't want to always be having to fuss with your veil. Uh, what is the smallest you would suggest going on the wimple? Oh, okay, so weirdly enough, I would actually suggest going larger on the wimple than I would on the veil, uh, simply because when you've pulled it up to your, around your face, it is going to pull the entire uh, bottom edge up. And from my experience, it'll pull up several inches. So I would say probably the smallest, I wouldn't suggest going much smaller than 30 inch. And I would probably suggest going closer to like 3740. Is that all our questions? Oh, there she is. Does anybody else have any questions? You're welcome. Long or wide on the wimple? Uh, so on the wimple, you would want some, it doesn't have to be super wide on one side, but it does have to be quite long because you do want something that not only goes up to towards the back of your fillet, but something that will basically cover um, your sort of like a boat neckline. So maybe think from, if you took a tape measure, like a cloth tape measure, and measured from the point of one shoulder into a scoop to the point of the other shoulder and added six inches to that, that's probably a good idea of the shortest length you're going to want. Somebody's asking, well, actually a couple people have asked if you can do another class on embellishments. Oh yeah, I can do that later. She does really good work. I'm, I'm, I'm a <laughs> fan myself. I love embroidery. I've been advised I'm not allowed to buy any more silk thread and I'm not listening to that at all. <laughs> what outfit would you wear with the veil? Uh, really were worn. So because veils, especially in Western Europe, were tied to religious connotations of chastity and virginity and purity, uh, they were worn by every level of woman. Everyone from beggar up to queen would have worn a head covering. Uh, and for most of the time period, that would have been a veil. So... For me, like the outfit I'm wearing right now, which I know it looks quite late period, it's actually not, oddly enough, uh, but I would absolutely wear a veil with this. Uh, I would probably not wear a wimple because this isn't the right time period, but I would probably wear a veil just like that and just pin it down. I'm a very loose woman, you can tell, because I've got my hair showing. Uh, <laughs> um, and I also have a, a dress that's, I mean, it's, I call it my work dress. It's literally oatmeal colored 
heavy linen with no sleeves. It's what I wear whenever I have to clean something that's probably going to stain. The very first time I wore it, a dog peed on me. Uh, so it's definitely my work dress. I've worn that with a wimple and a veil, uh, which is great in super hot events. If you are going to go to an event that you know is just a really hot, dry event, trust me, do a, do a wimple and veil. Or wimple, wimple and veil, I can't talk. I haven't drunk, I'm, I swear I haven't been drinking. Um, one, it will keep your neckline from getting scorched. You will not get any burns. Uh, and also, when I wear that, I feel like I'm about five to 10 degrees cooler, just instantaneously, possibly because I tend, I'm, you can't tell in this lighting, I swear, I'm, I'm fairly dark skinned and as you can tell, very dark haired. Uh, this is actually after I bleached my hair. Uh, so any kind of sunlight just tends to turn me into a roast. So light, light fabric is wonderful. Also, you can wet your veil, which is so nice during hot events, you can just, Get in, get in the water, wring it out, put it on, and you've got an instant cooler. So let's see, I've got a few more questions here. Let's yes. see. Um, would you embroider before or after hemming? I would embroider after hemming uh, because especially with embroidery, you tend to do black work or colored work, and you don't want this beautiful embroidery to suddenly have one white stitch over it because you missed. Uh, and you also don't want to start hemming and realize you've embroidered too close to the raw edge. And now you're going to have to hide some of your embroidery in that, that hem. So I would say with veils, hem first, then embroider. Regarding the kerchief for Norse, but related to Anglo-Saxon, was that mm -hmm. part of Norse or early Saxon Germanic culture in the British Isles? Or was it primarily Scandinavian? I saw that, I saw it most commonly in Norse depictions, um, but I did see a couple when I was looking into it I, I will admit this is ages ago, so I do not remember my sources. Uh, I caught, saw a couple of depictions. And I want to say they were in metal etchings. I want to say they weren't in stone etchings, uh, but there were a couple that were Anglo-Saxon as well. So that's, again, one of those odd things where if two cultures are close enough together, and especially if they're in the same climate, a lot of the utilitarian fabrics and clothings tend to just meld together where you'll see the same or similar things happening. Um, Kaya, I do see your question. I'm gonna ask it in a few minutes because it'll probably require moving the camera. So, um, so uh, how did, uh, so the next question we go with is, how did pre-Christian cultures use veils? For example, pagan cultures were not as obsessed with purity. Uh, it was still pretty common, but I think this is me guessing at this point. Um, but I, I agree, it really wasn't as much about uh, purity. However, I think that you did frequently, especially in Norse cultures, uh, they were used as part of the symbolism for whether or not you were married. Uh, that happened before Christianity really took hold. So it could still be used as a status symbol, uh, but I think a lot of it honestly was just cleanliness and keeping yourself warm and or cool. Um, because hair is one of the harder things to maintain cleanliness on and make it look clean all the time. And that is made easier if you have got your hair covered and you're not having dirt and grime get into it throughout your day as you're working. For older, or, or I'm sorry, older, for colder seasons, what mm -hmm. fabric would you use? You can still use linen. Um, you can still use fairly lightweight uh, linen for your veils. Uh, however, you can use wool. You can also use a heavier weight linen, just be aware, which I learned the hard way. Uh, if you are making a heavier weight linen veil, don't make it as big. If you, if you tend to like those really lovely flowing long veils, don't do that with really heavyweight linen because you will have the biggest headache because <laughs> it will just be dragging your head back all day. Um, but you can wear heavier, heavier weights. It's very weird that you can wear a lightweight linen and it will keep you cooler in the summer, but it will also keep you warmer in the winter. I don't get the physics. I know it has something to do with sunlight not hitting you in the summer and your body heat staying closer to your body because you've got that insulation factor in the winter. But weirdly enough, it works both ways. I've also found that silk is good for winter. Oh, yeah. Winter. Silk is summer. really insulating. Yeah. Um, so this is a question uh, that is kind of more uh, related to 
you know, someone else that you and I both know well. Um, but <laughs> what is the best way to add a ruffle? <laughs> oh my gosh, no, I'm not that person. Christiana is that person. So, um, I haven't done a straight ruffle on a veil, but if you're talking, well, I've got a question. Are you talking the super tight, like, ruffle that's about an inch tall and it's like really, really ruffled? Or are you talking just a very light ruffling? Like more like a slight wave to it. We'll uh, see what that answer is when they okay. pop out. Okay. Um, the first one. Um, okay, so that one tends to be something you create separately and then attach to the veil. Uh, and for those, you do tend to use, need to use slightly heavier weight linen uh, just because, okay, imagine I'm going to make a ruffle out of, I've decided that this is no longer a fillet, I want to ruffle out of it. Uh, so you are going to do the same thing here. You're going to take your fabric, you're going to double it over because the edge of your ruffle is going to be on that, that fold. And then you're literally going to serve accordion fold it like so and that's how you're getting your ruffle and then you Did would you sew it, it a little higher we can't see you would sew it right towards this back edge because you want this ruffle to fan out on its own like that and you're going to use a ridiculous amount of fabric to do that i think it's normally either three times or four times the length of what you're sewing it to is what you need for the ruffle so you will sew that together at the back. You will then, this is so much harder to do with one piece of fabric. I was not, I was not prepared for this part. That's okay. So she's, she is planning on doing a class on, um, on building them also. Oh God, good. Do, do Christiana's class. I'm like, I'm not good at this. So <laughs> you would end up having to sew it onto a band at the bottom, like so. And then that band is sewn to your veil. Christiana will have way more information about this than I do because it's her thing. Her veils are amazing. It is her thing. Um, let's see. Um, sorry. Um, I've read somewhere that Byzantine Sicilian used colored veils. Any thoughts? I don't know specifically about Sicilian, uh, but Byzantine, yes. I also know very late period Venice did it, so I would bet that Sicilian did too. Um, white veils tend to be much more common in, mostly in Western Europe, uh, and also in some Middle Eastern, but I think that was much more a hot sunlight issue than a, we prefer this color issue. Um, but yeah, I've absolutely seen, uh, also, was it, I think it was Byzantine also had striped veils, which were pretty cool looking. I haven't done the Byzantine persona. So I haven't looked into it totally, but I've definitely seen those and was like, ooh, those are pretty. I want one of those. So uh, the, the last question that I have right now <laughs> is, um, can I see how you hold the veil while sewing it? Um, I can't figure out how to hold down the fold and comfortably sew. How do I hold, that's a good question. How do I hold this when I'm sewing it? Okay, so I tend to, Mm, you're right. This is definitely going to have to have this turned. Whee. And that's why I waited for the question. <laughs> <laughs> Can I get lower? Yes, there we go. Okay, so I tend to, with my left hand, or maybe just more commonly my non-dominant hand, I will lightly hold this fold down, and I'll hold it down about a half inch ahead of where I'm sewing. And then... I so weird. I apologize. I pinched the fabric with my right hand between my ring finger and my middle finger to keep it taut. Oh, I'm sorry. I lied. Between my ring and my pinky finger. Like this. Told you I so weird. So that keeps this a little taut so I don't have to fit, futz with it so much. And then I tend to make the stitches at that point. So that's how I hold the veil, but please feel free to mess around with it because you will find whatever works best for you. My mother still thinks I crochet the wrong way because I hold my yarn the wrong way and she's wrong, but that's okay. She's not, she's right. It hurts my hand. So that's what I tend to do. Does that help? Yes. 
Yay. Um, so that is all the questions that I see. Brilliant. Um, if you have other questions, feel free to IM me on Facebook. Uh, I am under my SCA name, Helena Zancani. As far as I know, I'm the only one on Facebook with that name. So it should be fairly easy to find me.